Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the Renaissance, uh, with its emphasis on freedom of inquiry, began to influence not just the arts, but the sciences as well. Now, if I were to tell you that the Earth was the center of the universe and that all the planets and even the sun orbited it, uh, you would think I'm crazy. Yet if I proclaimed the same view 500 years late, earlier, excuse me, I would not only not be crazy, I would be considered quite rational indeed and thought to be a very good Christian too. Well, at least in Western Europe. Science and religion do not often go together. They should really be searching for what we may understand as the truth. One through belief and sometimes mystical experience, and the other through the empirical method, through observation. Yet these two worlds collided in a very dramatic way in the 16th and 17th century, when a series of scientists challenged the status quo, the religious as well as cultural beliefs that the earth was the center of the universe, proposing that the earth orbited around the sun instead. Now, I hope we do not see uh, too much of our present age in this discussion, but I'm afraid we have changed very little indeed. Human nature this is very consistent. From the Roman period uh, through to the Middle Ages and on into the early modern period, explanations of the universe relied on what's called the Ptolemaic system, especially in the Latin West which in short brought together the astronomy of Ptolemy from his work known as the Almagest, published around 150 CE, with the cosmology of the third century BC philosopher by the name of Aristotle. <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look uh, at the Ptolemaic system, uh, Margie. There we go, yes. So over the years, uh, modifications and even additions were made to the system, but for the most part, the central themes remain the same, especially the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe, a viewpoint believed to buttress the Church's claim uh, that God viewed this planet as the center of all things, well, besides that of heaven, of course. This view of the world as the center of the universe evolved even further with the Earth and its immediate surroundings actually believed as constituting the entire actual universe, a perspective known as geocentrism. According to this cosmological architecture, the Earth resided within a series of concentric spheres, each with one of the sky wanderers. Now, by the way, uh, in Greek, that's known as planeo. Uh, the, that means wanderer, uh, from whence we get the word planet. And these planets are locked and embedded along its sphere. That includes both the sun and moon, too. As for the stars, they were entirely contained within the spheres that enabled them to move around a certain rate. Now, the ancients believed in the four basic elements with an extra spiritual fifth. Earth, air, fire, water, with ether or spirit stuff uh, in addition. They were ordered according to weight, with the earth first, followed by water, air, fire, and then ether. Because earth was the heaviest, the ancients logically placed this element at the very center of the cosmos. In the outermost regions of these spheres was believed to reside God and his hosts of angels. This realm was made of the lightest element, that of ether. And of course, in the Greco-Roman period, these would be the various gods, right? Okay. Of course, let's go to the next uh, slide. Of course, the, uh, it's very small, but the Ptolemaic model was not able to explain in any comprehensive manner certain uh, phenomena that beg further explanation. Uh, for instance, ancient and medieval observers were perplexed 
when they noted that at certain times, the planets appeared to move backwards. Ptolemy and his commentators believe these backward motions could be understood through what are known as epicycles. And this is in this image here. In this theory, uh, each respective planet moved along a small circle, an epicycle, as the middle of the epicycle moved along a larger circle called a deferent with the earth at or near its center. So that's kind of the idea. Thank you, Margie, for that. Good, very good. So this monolithic Ptolemaic model uh, began to erode away between the 16th and 17th centuries with the once matter of fact presumptions that the earth was the center of the universe now coming under scrutiny uh, through more uh, sophisticated deductive strategies. In fact, some were actually saying, can you believe it, <laughs> that the earth circled around the sun <laughs> and that it was uh, not the center of the universe. Of course, the realization of a more expansive cosmos out there with millions of stars arrived slowly and had many obstacles to face, especially with the established church. Furthermore, the scientific revolution cannot be pinpointed to a defined short period of time, which constitutes a revolution, uh, how we use the word revolution today, but was a very diverse and spread out movement that was not uh, particularly uh, well organized. And furthermore, some of the advances were based upon premises of earlier scientific inquiries from the Greek and Roman periods that happened to be re-entering into academic discussion, especially following the, the fall of Constantinople in 1453, but even earlier. This is when many Byzantine scholars uh, brought their ideas to the Latin West. In a sense, I'm going to say something. Here we go. When the philosophy of Plato, long forgotten in the Latin West, arrived from the Greek East, the long-established Aristotelian philosophy that was that actually had merged so comfortably with the observations of, of Ptolemy were upset. That's really the key ingredient. As a result, the entire architecture of the cosmological structure was suddenly brought into question as concrete religious certainties became suddenly scientific supposition. It is really knocking down Aristotle. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I should write a book about how Plato changed the entire paradigm of the West. I should also tell you, uh, make write another book on how Aristotle held us back. Um, Aristotle is good for some things. He's not good when it comes to metaphysics. I'm sorry, you're gonna see that in a few moments. Don't worry, I will demonstrate everything. So let's start with a, let's start with Nicholas Copernicus. So let's go to the next picture. Let's take a look at him, see what he looks like. Nicholas Copernicus, uh, here we go. 1473 to 1543, he was a Polish astronomer, uh, one of the earliest uh, pioneers to reject an Earth-centered or geocentric universe. Uh, beginning his education in Krakow, uh, Copernicus continued his education in Padua, Italy. Once upon Italian soil, Copernicus first came upon ancient Hellenistic and Roman and Byzantine thought related to the nature of the cosmos. Copernicus was so determined to learn uh, this mysterious knowledge from the Greek East that he taught himself Greek uh, through uh, Theodorus Gaza's grammar, as well as J.B. Christonius' dictionary. Uh, moving from Padua to Bologna, Copernicus came upon the writings of a Byzantine monk and philosopher by the name of Basilia Vesaria, uh, who was educated in Constantinople before its fall, and even studied under the famous Platonist by the name of Gemestus Plepton. 
Uh, in fact, let's go to the next picture. Plethon. There we go. There's a good picture of Plethon. Plethon uh, really uh, changed our perspectives uh, in the West, uh, bringing with him the works of Plato, um, Bessarion, um, actually after he became metrop uh, metro metropolitan of Nicaea uh, by the Byzantine emperor uh, John Paleologos in 1437, actually accompanied Plethon to Italy in order to bring about a reunion between the Orthodox and Catholic churches uh, so that the Byzantine Empire, well, what was left of it, could receive possible help uh, from the Latin West against the advancing Ottoman Turks. When hopes for reunion began to crumble, Bessarion defected to the Catholic Church, became a cardinal, and lived the rest of his life in Italy, uh, bringing with him his collection of books and manuscripts, uh, and creating a center for learning about his palace uh, in Rome. Uh, by the way, this, of course, this is the image of Plethon. Uh, if you had a chance to listen to my talk on the Renaissance, I can't say enough about Plethon. Uh, uh, just to reiterate just a little bit, because I do, because we're trying to cover moving into scientific knowledge in connection with religion, I, I'd be remiss not to mention Plethon even within uh, this context. And basically, uh, Pl Pl Plethon, who was considered really a heretic, uh, by those uh, in the Byzantine Empire. I don't even like calling it the Byzantine Empire because in reality, they just knew themselves as the Roman Empire, uh, the part that didn't fall because uh, the Western half fell in, in, in 1453, sorry, sorry, in four, uh, sorry, uh, 476, excuse me. The Eastern part continued to 1453. But th the problem is, is that uh, what will happen is all that knowledge of antiquity continued in the East, the Greek East, but was not in the Latin West. There was a little revival of ancient knowledge uh, as a result of accessing information from Muslim Spain, and that started scholasticism, where those in the Latin West get a hold of Aristotle, and they use that to buttress up uh, their, their, their Catholic uh, theology, as well as to kind of really bring that home in together with the Ptolemaic system. But they didn't have much of Plato. Well, what happens is Plethon, they actually had three copies of, of works of, of, of Plato in Latin, but most of his works were not there. It was Plethon that brought Plato to the West and brought it to the Medici family. And the Medicis, of course, I went ahead and created this, this great Platonic Academy and which all these works of Plato were distributed. And so much of the mindset of the West will be changed as a result of that. And much of that will be, we'll see in a, in a few moments, will influence not only uh, scientific thought and inquiry and how we look at things, but will even influence the, 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 the changeover from a... Um, uh, a geocentric into a heliocentric uh, universe. So that's just a few things to think about. Anyway, let's go to the next picture. There we go. This is Bessarion, and uh, this is what he looks like. Let me take a look at the next picture. This would be a good one here. This right here is a little small, uh, but this is Bessarion's house where he collected his uh, books and manuscripts. Uh, this became a center for learning. Here he collected great scholars from all around. Um, and uh, of course, both Plethon and Bessarion brought the philosophy of Plato back to the Latin West. Unlike Plethon, Bessarion sought to figure out ways to somehow systematically bring the philosophies of Plato and Aristotle together, especially within uh, religious contexts. Bessarion, as well as other Byzantine scholars, greatly influenced the philosophical worldview of Copernicus, especially in providing him with the Platonic undergirding, which enabled him to dislodge himself of many of his Aristotelian suppositions that happened to be embedded within the Ptolemaic 
cosmological system. So let's go to the next picture. So after concluding his studies at Ferrara, receiving there his degree uh, in May of 1503, Copernicus eventually moved to the Baltic town of Frombork in 1512, and by 1514 proceeded to purchase the northwestern tower uh, that you see here uh, within a local fortress where he set up a makeshift observatory. Let's go to the next uh, picture. And this is uh, this is the, the fortress today with the church. Uh, it's it's uh, quite beautiful. So here, Copernicus watched the heavens with a critical eye over the years. Uh, the culmination of Copernicus's uh, findings were to be published in his On the Revolution of the Heavenly Spheres in 1543. Uh, by the way, which not coincidentally was also the year of his death. <laughs> so he publishes the, the the year that he died. Let's go to the next picture. I think I have a, an image of his system. There it is. Copernicus feared uh, the reaction to a book that he very well knew uh, directly it challenged the Ptolemaic geocentric universe and even went so far as to, well, to dedicate the work to Pope Paul III, <laughs> hoping that would at least appease some criticism. According to Copernicus, the Earth moved about the sun in a circle, a beautiful, perfect circle and not the other way around. You can see where there's a problem, but we'll, we'll get there. Because he did believe in a heliocentric universe. Yet Copernicus also adopted many aspects of the Ptolemaic system, including the epicycles. But these epicycles were much smaller and thereby at least a little bit more accurate. As far as the apparent backward movement of the planets, Copernicus explained that this was merely an optical illusion and that the planets in reality move forward and in a consistent manner. For Copernicus, the sun was the center of the universe, not the Earth. Yet the Earth was the center of gravity and the lunar sphere. Uh, still, for Copernicus, Aristotle's cosmology was no longer valid. But he was so caught up in the idea of the perfect circle. I mean, Plato talked about circles being the perfect shape of all, that obviously from his perspective and from his belief system, it must be a circle. But we know through the math that it doesn't add up. It doesn't work. And, you know, I'm not gonna, not gonna say, I'm kind of wanting to say something. It's like he had this ideal, even if it was defective, and he is a guilty, in many ways, as those who believed in a geocentric universe of imposing a viewpoint he believed it was true and must be true. So we got to force the math to make it true. And it doesn't work. Okay, so I'm sorry. I like Copernicus quite a bit, but there's problems. Well, so there's another step that needs to happen. And then, of course, the next scientific revolution step was made by the Danish astronomer by the name of Tycho Brahe. Uh, let's go to the next picture. There he is. <laughs> 1546 uh, to 1601. Uh, he got started uh, at the tender age of 17 as a Danish astronomer. Uh, Tycho wrote as follows at 17. He says, I've studied all available charts of the planets and stars, and none of them match the others. He's saying this at 17. Wow. <laughs> there are just as many measurements and methods as there are astronomers, and all of them disagree. What's needed is a long-term project with the aim of mapping the heavens conducted from a single location over a period of several years, unquote. And with that, said Tycho, uh, he went out, out and to establish uh, his goal. Uh, in fact, uh, he established a place uh, known as Urenberg. Uh, let's take a look at the next uh, image. That's what it looked like at that time right there. Uh, Urenberg was built between 1576 and 1580 on the island of Venn, which is between Denmark and Sweden. 
Uh, it was the very first custom-built observatory in modern Europe, uh, and the last one, by the way, without a telescope. It was built as an, also uh, the design, let's take a look at the next image. It's kind of interesting. It was built, you can see here, as an astrological talisman uh, to increase the influence, he believed, of the sun and Jupiter. Uh, it was also surrounded by what is also, he called the Garden of Eden, which cultivated various fruits and herbs for his alchemy and included also an underground observatory. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Margie. Okay, so uh, Tycho, I had a rather uh, colorful lifestyle. Uh, he possessed 1% <laughs> of the total wealth of Denmark, which is, um, <laughs> you know, uh, he lived a high life in his great castle, as you saw. Uh, he had a clairvoyant dwarf uh, by the name of Jep, who was not only acted as his, as his court jester, but even hid under the table during dinner, presuming that he could read the minds of Tycho's guests. Some of his guests, of course, included uh, the future uh, 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 James I of England, for example. So he was quite notable. Tycho also had the bridge of his nose that was uh, replaced, um, made out of silver and gold. Uh, what happened is he lost his nose in a duel with a fellow Danish nobleman by the name of Manderop uh, Parju. Uh, according to this, uh, accordingly, uh, this motivated Tycho to learn about both medicine and alchemy. <laughs> Sees the man with the silver and gold nose. <laughs> anyway. While Tycho was the very last of the astronomers to observe the stars with the naked eye, he still managed uh, to create a disciplined regiment of direct observation, building better instruments and creating a methodology that would be considered a standard for years to come. Tycho, with the assistance of his sister, observed on November 11, 1572, an appearance of a, suddenly of a very bright star. It was located in the Cassiopeia constellation. Now, Aristotle, back to him again, uh, as, as well, of course, this goes into uh, Ptolemy, but Aristotle had this idea of immutability or absolute changelessness, especially the region beyond the moon. It was central to Aristotle's worldview, yet, Right before his eyes, Tycho observed a strange thing that happened that seemed to be absolutely impossible. The star was near to the Earth, near supposedly uh, than the moon, and it was supposedly to be viewed along the, the canopy of static stars. But all of a sudden, you know, uh, with this moment, the celestial moment, he realized and calculated that, uh, hey, wait a second, the star was not fixed as popularly believed. Suddenly, he realized that the star was far more distant than the moon. It's not this black canopy with pinpricks and, the, and then, of course, the fire of beyond shining through it anymore, was it? No. <laughs> so he, he, when he realized this phenomenon, uh, the appearance of this bright star had not happened before. Uh, he said as follows. He says, oh, Krasa Ingenia, oh, Kekos Koli Spectanus, <laughs> which means, oh, thick wits, oh, blind watchers of the sky. <laughs> Yet, unlike Copernicus, Tycho continued to believe still in the Earth-centered universe with some qualifications asserting that while both the moon and sun revolved around the earth, the other planets revolved around the sun. It's kind of like this halfway point position. So we get to, here we go, da, 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 Johannes Kepler. Let's take a look at Kepler here. This is the big moment. I love Kepler. Sorry. Uh, you'll see why. There he is. Okay. Kepler, here he is. 1571 to 1630. He inherited his work uh, and adopted uh, the mythology, uh, methodology of uh, Tycho with the added irony that Tycho's methodology, as applied by Kepler, 
actually confirmed not Tycho's geocentric universe, but actually Copernicus's heliocentric universe. Kepler was born prematurely and was a very sickly child. And while, while in body he was weak, in, in mind he was strong, he's brilliant. He had a, a photographic memory. You would say any, um, anything in front of him, any number or combination, any fact, and he would be able to not remember it right at that moment, but way afterwards. He was just like this computer. Uh, too, so much so that uh, he was used to entertain uh, his, uh, his grandfather's guests at the inn where he grew up. Kepler's mother was a certain Katharina Guldman, who, uh, besides being the humble innkeeper's daughter, uh, happened to be involved in local herbalism. She was considered a local healer and a very uh, strong interest in astrology as well. Because the realms of astrology and astronomy blended together in the culture of the day, uh, those who were able to observe the stars with accuracy were also consulted to read the fortunes of various commoners. Now, his mother's love of, of observing the heavens soon passed to her son. In fact, when he was six years old, he observed the great comet of 1577, declaring that he, quote, was taken by his mother to a high place to look at it, unquote. When he was nine, he observed his first lunar eclipse. This is 1580. Noting that he was called outdoors to see it. Mom was right there to, to nurture that interest in him following in his mother's footsteps while Kepler attended the University of Tübinger. He was just as famous for his ability to read horoscopes and make astrological observations as he was a competent mathematician. You're hearing, there's an unfortunately. Yeah, uh, let's, uh, we'll pull down the picture for a few moments here, unfortunately. Unfortunately, his mother ran into a little trouble when a certain Ursula Reinbold, who Ursula, right? <laughs> so that's a sea witch from, <laughs> um, anyway, um, accused her of giving her a poisonous potion uh, after an argument. And while the lady survived this uh, apparent illness, she reported the incident to the authorities. And so Katharina was tried for witchcraft in 1615. This was initiated by a guy by the name of Lutheris Einborn. Uh, he was the, the Volt, uh, which is like the representative of the feudal lord in the area. And he, he actually accused of 15 other women uh, of sorcery and witchcraft. And unfortunately, eight of them uh, were executed under his orders. So he was after Kepler's mom. Of course, uh, Kepler attempted to defend his mother himself. This is important securing her escape to Linz in December of 1616, but she insisted on returning home to Leonberg in the summer of 1620. Immediately, she found herself in prison for 14 months, and she was subjected to, to torture, intending her to confess for her supposed crime. She refused. She was innocent. Her son managed to get her out in October 1620, but she died soon after the next year as a result of this. Obviously, you see what's going to happen here. There's been books written about this, too. How the church and religious authorities treated Kepler's own mother left a bitter taste in his mouth. Especially since she was so influential in his life. He says, I'm done. That's it. Uh-uh. I have nothing to do with them. And all this scholasticism and Aristotelian ideas. He transformed himself into a convinced follower of Plato. See how things, see how science can be subjective in many ways. 
It's not all scientific reasoning. Sometimes there's an emotional aspect that's involved. In this, in this case, it's mom. How could they do? How could the Inquisition do this to my mom? Kepler believed Copernicus was correct based upon their shared metaphysical and philosophical convictions that the Greek East retained a better grasp of the reality of the cosmological realm than the Latin West. In other words, their shared religious beliefs rather than their scientific inquiry motivated their pursuits. Does that make sense? As opposed uh, to the Western embraced Ptolemaic Aristotelian system where the earth was intended to be the center, the Greek embraced a uh, Platonist perspective of emanations moving from the monad. Let's take a look at the next image so you can see it for yourself, how it works. So there he is. There it is. Okay, so this is the Platonic system. Okay, so here uh, in this idea, there are emanations moving from the monad or the one or the beautiful, right? This is the, the cause of knowledge, the cause of existence, right? So what happens here is this one conceived as the good or God. Um, you have these emanations moving down to the material realm of the earth, which most definitely allowed for the idea of this monad as represented by the one sun. Kepler was convinced, like the Platonists, that God created the cosmos according to an intelligible plan, a rational blueprint that could be realized through knowledge, gnosis. And so for him, the universe itself constituted the emanations that you see here that proceeded from God, the very reflective image of God. Accordingly, uh, Kepler viewed the Father as represented by the Son, the stellar sphere as represented by the, uh, uh, by the Son, and of course the realm between and moving down to the earth as representing the Holy Spirit. Just like Plato uh, and both ancient and Renaissance Neoplatonists, Kepler directly correlated knowledge with the idea of light. And so because the light appeared to originate from the sun, then God, who is all-knowing, must be represented by the sun and must also be the center of the universe, not the earth. Kepler also believed that the Bible supported a heliocentric rather than a geocentric universe, quoting from both the Old and New Testaments to support his case in his very first work, known as the Mysterium. Most especially the Gospel of John correlated knowledge with the light and then in turn to God as revealed through the word or the logos. So there you see this all here. Uh, in this chart, uh, let's go to the next next image here. The one before uh, before that, I mean after that. Um, oh, I guess I didn't have it. Okay, that's all right. I guess it just didn't didn't show. It's okay. All right, we'll, we'll turn it down. So Kepler also agreed on religious philosophical grounds that Copernicus was correct in his theory that the earth circled the sun and not the other way around. But he also realized the mistake that Copernicus did in this idea of circular orbits that was fundamentally flawed. That's not right. You know, he's, he's a Platonist, but he's not going to press his Platonic thoughts if it doesn't agree with the math and it didn't so what he did is he looked mined through the works of, of Tycho Brahe found a logical idea that Tycho even uh, didn't see and he realized that uh, the planets did not have a circular orbit it moved uh, it had an elliptical orbit oh here we go and all of a sudden 
the math added up. You didn't have to force you know, anything into it. It worked. And he published this, this in 1609 in a work called On the Motion of Mars. Uh, so there you have it. I One thing more about, about Kepler, he did this through naked eye observations alone. He figured it out. And then going through Tycho's works with Copernicus, theoretical ideas, right? But but he still was a very logical man. You got to balance the two, right? And so, uh, and that's an important thing because a lot of people can't do that. That is kind of suspend your beliefs for a while to make sure if everything works out. The circle, the perfect platonic circle didn't work out. Got it? The elliptical orbit does and still is to this day how we view it. So, which means that now we go to the next step and that is Galileo. Yes, let's take a look at old Galileo. Poor Galileo. He has this great name, Galileo, Galilei. So, Margie, we'll show Galileo. The beard one. So, all the discoveries of, there he is. All the discoveries of Copernicus, Tycho, and Kepler were conducted through observations of the heavens uh, through the naked eye. But a certain Galileo Galilei of uh, 1564 to 1642 had an advantage. He had a device called a telescope that opened up an entire universe of new empirical data that would prove revolutionary, viewing stars and entire constellations never seen before, discovering, in fact, new stars in the Orion and the Pleiades. Near to home, much to his amazement, Galileo now recognized four moons orbiting Jupiter that will be known as Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, he saw spots moving on the sun, which is supposed to be pure and undefiled. But look, there's spots. As for the surface of the moon itself, Galileo dis discovered, which you can see, of course, craters with the naked eye. He saw valleys and uh, and, and mountains on the lunar surface, much more than his eyes opening in a physical sense. Galileo realized that the entire Ptolemaic system was a convenient cosmological convention that served a cultural and a religious agenda. His eyes were open to the scientific reality that contradicted centuries and centuries of assumptions, right? Now, convincing others of the universe that suddenly opened up to him was uh, really not going to be easy. In fact, it was near impossible in some cases. Uh, let's go to the next uh, image. For instance, Galileo wished to reveal this new universe to his colleagues at the University of Padua, <laughs> but that didn't go over so well since they were so upset by Galileo's description from what he saw through that telescope, that they actually refused to look through it, lest his descriptions prove true and force him to rethink all of what they've been taught uh, through the more approved channels, especially that of the heavens as described by the church, where the earth and not the sun was the center. It was, in a sense, peering through the devil's eye. And you will be through looking uh, through this lens, uh, deceived uh, by Satan himself. Oh, you can't do that. You know, so afraid. Yeah, we encounter that a lot nowadays, don't we? Uh, so afraid of the empirical truth of, of the facts that are observable that they just rather not even talk about it not even consider it, you know, you know, run away from it, lest they lose their perspectives and viewpoints that are so deeply entrenched uh, from childhood. Nevertheless, uh, in 1610, Galileo established the cosmos as viewed through his telescope and vigorously asserted that the earth moved around the sun, arguing against uh, Ptolemaic and Aristotelian theories, arguing otherwise. Galileo attempted to appease uh, the more intellectual Jesuits, revealing the four moons around Jupiter to the Jesuit Collegio Romano. And he was give some Jesuits some credit. And in their case, they did indeed look through the telescope. 
to see it for themselves. You see, um, it, it's the, we don't have to worry about the Jesuits. It's more, we have to worry about the Dominicans. That's who we have to worry about. The Jesuits, not so bad. <clears throat> Yet for a short period of time, Galileo made the prudent move of seeking patronage of Cosimo II de Medici in 1519, uh, 1621, his lifespan of, of Cosimo. Uh, this is in Florence. And he found just a way to do so. For the Medici family loved iconography, <clears throat> especially related uh, to Jupiter. And since Galileo just discovered four moons around their favorite planet, he decided to name them the Medici stars. Uh, <clears throat> well, at first, uh, it was it was it was actually known as the Cosmica Sidera, named after Cosimo. But he says no, you know. But eventually, his advisor said, "Well, name it after uh, the the four uh, the Medici family uh, members." <clears throat> but uh, well, the Medici family eventually decided not to give permission to use their name uh, for this discovery. They actually had to stop the presses in the middle of printing uh, his book and remove the Medici designation altogether. Let's go to the next picture. I think I do have a picture of the of the manuscript there. I may, oh, no, we don't. Okay, let's, we'll, we're, we'll put that picture down. We're gonna go to him in a few moments. <laughs> well, what happens is, is that um, uh, they, when they, when they realized the amazement, uh, it was amazement, uh, this, uh, uh, he's so good at uh, uh, giving them credit for these, you know, naming after these moons, they did put him under patronage. So that was good. That was good. So he got patronage and they helped him distribute his new book uh, and through the diplomatic mail service. And that was, that was real helpful. Thank you, the Medici family, uh, helping out uh, Florentines for uh, for 100 years now, right? <laughs> At that time. Uh, they provided a great deal of exposure. Uh, but Galileo's luck was, you know, really nuts, uh, especially with the publication of the dialogue and the two chief systems of the world in 1612. Uh, here, uh, Galileo emphasized the fact that the universe, every movement, was subject to mathematical laws operating with exact precision, detail by detail, and that the planetary and stellar movements could be calculated exactly. Even the movement of the earth around the sun. In fact, Galileo forwarded the idea that from the smallest atom to the greatest heavenly object, they all operated through identical mathematical principles. By the way, the atomic theory is an ancient theory. It goes back to Lucretius, if you're interested in that, uh, from the first century BCE. It was already part of, of theoretical ideas. Just a fun bit, just to throw in there. <laughs> okay, well, the book was a disaster and was almost immediately condemned by the church, especially his assertion of a sun-centered universe. And now we get to that picture of this gentleman, and it's pretty upsetting. Here we go. Um, and we're learning a lot in this. Yeah, there he is. And you know what? I like the fact that this picture is so small and blurry <laughs> because he deserves it. Uh, also, what happens, there's a certain, his name is Tommaso, Caccini lived from 1574 to 1648, who decided that Galileo's little heretical discovery would make a fine object lesson on the dangers of man-made science and the means of gaining some fame too, possibly advancing him up through the Dominican order. So Caccini perceived himself as another Thomas Aquinas. The very reason he was known as Tommaso in the first place. And so Sunday after Sunday, let's go to the next picture. Sunday after Sunday, Caccini blasted Galileo from the pulpit of the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella uh, in Florence. Uh, so he started this in 1614, making uh, him look like a radical and a dangerous one at that. Yet Caccini was hardly a Thomas Aquinas. I mean, really little interest in coordinating theological with philosophical ideas. For in his blind fanaticism, he actually taught that mathematics and science were contrary to the Bible. Whoa. And that Galileo's observations relating that the earth orbited the sun was not only heretical, but 
close to blasphemy for its hubris, its claim to know the orchestration of the heavens more than what is revealed in scripture. <laughs> no, Caccini asserted, the earth was motionless, just like Aristotle said. It did not move, as Galileo said. And to say that the earth then moved around the sun was dangerous. It was treacherous. In one of his sermons, he quotes Acts chapter 1, 11, where the inhabitants of Galilee were depicted as looking into the heavens with the expectation that Jesus was going to return. And where an angel comes to them declaring, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up in heaven? <laughs> in what he thought was a clever twist, Caccini contrasted Galileo's allegedly heretical acts to the faith of the inhabitants of Galilee, asserting that those of Galilee were to be followed and not the followers of Galileo. No, follow the Galileans, not Galileo. Uh, it's, it's a very poor wordplay uh, in Latin and Italian, but there you have it. As for Galileo's reaction to this whole charade, he declared that Caccini was a man, quote, of very great ignorance, no less a mind full of venom and devoid of charity, unquote. Oh, but there's another misfortune befell Galileo to help seal his fate for the man so responsible for smoothing out his relations with the church for his past publications. Uh, he read these words out loud to the Pope and explained them. Uh, his name is Ciampoli. Uh, well, what happened is that he was uh, uh, he was dismissed. And then the Spanish admonished Pope Urban for his moral laxity and lack of zeal pursuing a 30-year war. They said, you got to do something. So what happened is, what's the convenient thing to do? Go along with Tommaso, of course. It wasn't long next to the next image. Yeah, next one here. It wasn't long until Galileo was brought to trial by the church for his heretical teachings. Naturally, Cucina was present, adding a certain flourish to his accusations, going as far as saying that the followers of Galileo were not only beginning to question the miraculous power of the saints, but were even proceeding as far as questioning the very nature of God, even his existence. Everyone was impressed with Cucino, Cucini and his profoundly religious arguments. And so he, by the way, he eventually got the promotion he so coveted as a result. Yeah, he became the prior of the monastery of San Marco. It worked. Oh, man. The church rewarded Caccini for his vital services of ridding Italy of these heretics. So oh, we, can put the, we can put the picture down. The trial uh, did not go well, as you can imagine. Um, in 1616, Cardinal Roberto Baramino or Galileo, never, 1616, he never, never to teach about his observations ever again, especially that the earth moved around the sun. It was over. Galileo was to be severely humbled by the church for his heresy. Next, Galileo had to recant his beliefs or face certain death. And so without choice, he recanted the fact that the earth moved around the sun and the summation of all his teachings, all his teachings. He had to declare himself in front of everybody a fraud. Yet under his breath, according to one story, right? Right after the recantation, he was said, said to a whispered, he put us in with it. It, the earth, still moves. It was a recantation of necessity, not conviction, but it did silence Galileo. By papal order, Galileo was placed under house arrest in Rome and isolated from all people he knew. I mean, this is in 1616. Eventually, in 1634, from 1616 to 1634, he's isolated, can't do anything. Eventually, in 1634, he moved to a country house at Arcitru, uh, near Florence. And at that point, he could receive visitors. Yet, he's useless now. Why? He can't make any observations into the night skies. Why? Because uh, he was going blind. 
Yeah. Yeah. By 1638, Galileo was completely blind. Finally, in 1642, Galileo was suffering from a fever and heart troubles died. What a sad end. What a sad end. In this case, of course, the religious hierarchy won the day. Uh, perception was more important than the looking for the truth. You can't change these paradigms. They must always stand still. Aristotle, Ptolemy, the pillars of these, this, this religious fanaticism and this anti-science movement. Moving conceptually from the geocentric universe of Ptolemy, as understood via an Aristotelian framework, long entrenched in the minds of those in the Latin West, to the heliocentric universe buttressed by Platonism of the Greek East, proved difficult because of the religious dogmatism of the Catholic Church at that time. Even common perception, so based upon a faith as opposed to an evidential worldview, worked against these scientists attempting to discover the true nature of the universe. The scientific revolution was more of a process than anything during the 16th and 17th centuries, working slowly from Copernicus, who received the sun-centered universe from ancient and Byzantine scholars, especially influenced by Platonism, to Tycho Brahe, who created the mathematical methodology through disciplined observation, as well as understanding the universe is infinitely beyond the scope of mere concentric sphere, to Kepler, who combined Copernicus's beliefs in a, in a heliocentric universe with Tycho's methodology and realizing the orbits were actually elliptical, the circulars, and finally to Galileo, who was able to empirically confirm the views of Copernicus, Tycho, and Kepler through means of the telescope, discovering new stars and being the four moons around Jupiter. It is a gradual, slow process. As we can see, the biggest adversary to advancement in science was and will often continues to be religion. Societies become accustomed to certain belief systems throughout the ages, and when they are challenged, rather than become flexible or attempt to perceive their beliefs in a different manner, the general response is insecurity, leading to aggression and a desperate need to retain the normative views as to assert the stability, hoping to preserve certain power structures, by the way, as well, whether religiously or politically based. Humanity, like it or not, I'm going to say this is very conservative in nature, set upon protecting themselves at all costs. And the gut instinct says to act first, think later in so many responses. We go into this fight, flight, and freeze kind of responses. Thinking out everything out rationally upon the first encounter with something new and unknown, by the way, is unusual and goes against the core of humanity's survival instincts. Yet belief, especially religious belief, often has this ability to do so and to fully indoctrinate a person or a group with a pre-established worldview that is so consuming in all levels that any given individual, a group or society within this belief system, even when faced with scientific evidence appearing to be so overwhelming and so carefully scrutinized, will instantly, will instantly reject it if it looks like it could proceed against their predetermined religious views or the proposed view idea automatically receiving absolutely no consideration whatsoever. It was what we saw in many of these cases with Galileo. The grid work here uh, uh, is either fits the religiously pre-established worldview and so be esteemed as correct, or it doesn't fit and so be incorrect without much latitude for shades of gray, especially for those who are overtly fundamentalist in their standpoint. For us today, the idea that the earth is stationary and all the planets, including the sun, orbit around it will be as ridiculous as saying the world is flat. But we must recollect that the majority of the people of Western Europe believe that, even though the intellectuals did not. 
and that this belief was intimately part of the cosmological order that was upheld by the church at that time. But fortunately, nobody today believes the earth is flat. <sighs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the United States alone, it last, last survey, 2% believe the world is flat and 8% are unsure. And that, that was done in, in, in 2022. What are you guys, what are you guys thinking there? Is this interesting? Yeah, yes. And it was this religious perception that fought against scientific views considered as matter of fact scientific reality today. But it's it's we we can't we don't do very well with paradigm shifts. We don't. And the thing is, it's it's true. I you know I hate to talk about I like Thomas Kuhn. Uh, he talks about paradigm uh, shifts. Scientific truth cannot be established solely by objective criteria, but is defined by consensus of the scientific community. So there is a subjective aspect of it, says Kuhn, which I teach in one of my classes called Visions of Science and Technology. It's true. We don't like paradigm shifts. We want to, hold, and even scientists are, we got to hold on. Our whole reputation is based on these ideas. We don't want to lose it. Okay. So let's keep on going. Without question, the next step. All right, we're, we're moving here. The question of empiricism had classical use, uh, roots. We're going there. For example, emphasized by Aristotle. But this empiricism, but this philosophical perspective professing that knowledge arises primarily through sensory experiences with a focus upon tangible evidence is also very much a product of the Renaissance. And as can be imagined, this pursuit of evidence that could be observed and tested all too often contradicted the asserted facts arriving from the status quo, especially the church. For many Renaissance scholars, it was not enough to passively accept various received traditions from church theologians and from earlier Greek and Roman thinkers, for they began to determine that nothing should escape careful empirical examination. Leonardo da Vinci declared, uh, if you find from your experience that something is a fact and it contradicts what some authority has written down, then you must abandon that authority and base your reasoning upon your own findings, unquote. That's not me, that's Leonardo da Vinci. Of course, such sentiment was often considered open rebellion uh, for the guardians of the ecclesiastical establishment. Uh, those scholars who did manage to boldly take these authorities to task often had, you know, very powerful positions of uh, patrons. For example, the Medici's of Florence, right? <laughs> With the Renaissance, the idea was suggested that the discipline, by the way, of history, which is what I do as well, was a fixed body of fact much like the other branches of knowledge. The belief became that history ought to be a science with fundamentals and absolutes. The emphasis of this new paradigm of inquiry was that humanity had the potential to learn about everything there is to know, inclusive of history and the nature of reality, and compile this evidence in enormous proportions. There was this, how do I say this, 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 es ist ein Lust zu leben, you know, there is this um, uh, lust to live, uh, where you, you, you can learn it all without limitations, given enough time and the compiling of evidence. There's a sense of optimism in this possibility, I'll bet a naive one, right? Permeating the scientific and philosophical circles, this is coming about Petrarch and Bowdoin built upon this theory, uh, you know, these libraries, right? Uh, believing that we can truly know all the history about the Hebrews, the Greeks, and the Romans. The self-aware idea of history as a historical discipline comes about at this time. Before, uh, history of the Jews, and then in turn, much of the history of the Middle Ages was built around the idea that God directly intervened in the affairs of humanity and the prophets, uh, being able, of course, to foresee the future, future history, with the direct knowledge coming from God, and they were able to reveal the general outline of predetermined events, uh, but, but never, never completely. Uh, so as a result, history was 
consistently is seen as sacred history, a mindset always affecting the theological questions. While today we often still see things affected through cause and effect, the pivotal center is not necessarily orchestration from a divine source, yet the very idea that the very nature reality could be eventually understood based upon human efforts alone without direct revelation from God or by means of the province would have appeared as hubris from the medieval perspective. But this was not necessarily the case for those during the Renaissance and then moving into the Enlightenment. There is a certain irony that the obsessive need to collect information uh, to eventually prove the truth of one's beliefs was actually part of not just the Renaissance, but the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> so happened during the Reformation, just throw this one for fun, the squabble between Catholics and Protestants uh, led to the need to justify their own truth claims. It actually proved to be beneficial for historians <laughs> because each side are massing giant libraries, uh, seeking to uh, finding you know various manuscripts and in dusty monasteries to prove that their view is orthodox one or the other. Uh, so, for instance, the Calvinists on one side and the Jesuits collected such documents, saving so much incidentally uh, for later historians. Thank you so much for your fighting. <laughs> it helped us so much. Again, these theologians like the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment scholars believe the very gathering of enough of these ancient and medieval documents would prove the validity of their religious suppositions. Then we go to who I love, and you're going to love too. I'm, I sure you will. Uh, I'm going to bring home the bacon. What kind of bacon? I'm bringing home Francis Bacon. So let's go. Let's go to Francis Bacon. Let's see him. Uh, oh, Francis. This is the famous. Um, um, there he is. And his name is right there, too. Huh? Francis Bacon was well known for his development of the empirical method in relation to science, along with his views of religion in general, beyond being known as an accomplished philosopher. Francis Bacon was also noted as a historian, an acclaimed moralist, a lawyer. <laughs> How I got these two words side by side in the same sentence, I'll never know. <laughs> Sorry, lawyers. Uh, and even a royal officer. Now, Bacon was nothing but resolute when it came to his, his goals. He actually outlined three goals. First and foremost, Bacon sought to discover the nature of truth in the universe. Second, Bacon sought to serve his country. He was always proud, patriotic Englishman. Third, Bacon sought to serve his church, which is not often easy because he had to keep the other two in balance. What is true that he has garnished a reputation? as the father of empiricism, and even known as the one who instilled the desire amongst so many of his colleagues to always experiment and demonstrate their theories with uh, actual, tangible evidence, it really was better in the rhetorical department than actual application of his own theories. And I might add, some even regarded him as some of, a, of an amateur in areas that he was declared to be the definitive excerpt by his letters. Let's go to the next one, next image. With that said, Bacon truly created the environment, the intellectual universe, whereby such applications induced by his lofty ideals would nourish and grow into methodologies applied by scientists today. Bacon argued against the deductive methods so prominent in his era. And you can see there's uh, the chart under here. You have deductive reasoning. The deductive reasoning is a process of reasoning that starts from the general statements to reach a logical conclusion. It involves moving from a general to a specific, a top-down approach. The conclusion has to be true if the premises are true. And finally, comparably more difficult to use as we need facts that are definitely true. So he argued against this deductive methodology uh, and to pursue instead inductive reasoning, moving from proven fact to axiom and then on to, to, to law. So we see here inductive reasoning is the process of reasoning that moves from specific observations to broader generalizations. It involves moving from specifics to general, uh, a bottom, uh, uh, approach, the truth of 
premises does not necessarily guarantee the truth of the conclusions. We typically use inductive reasoning in our daily lives since it's fast and easy to use. He encouraged this methodology. Yet this is where Bacon knew philosophical and scientific pursuits became tricky, for he believed the mind was so clouded with all sorts of distractions that it got in the way of the pursuit of truth. And so before even proceeding towards induction, he said, the philosopher or scientist or any other inquirer needed to liberate their mind from false notions or tendencies which distort the truth. He looked about him and noted the shackles of the religious and cultural conventions weighing so heavily upon the human psyche, and he grieved that most could only really discern uh, mere shadows of reality or the possibility of truth, a faint glimpse, perhaps, of objective reality, of truth itself. And so he came up with something. Ascertaining the landscape of so many misperceptions, Bacon created a list of what he believed were some of the very worst distractions invading the typical mind at any time or possibly germinating within that distracted uh, reasoning faculty to the point where it was utterly handicapped and unable to see the light of reason. Ironically enough, while Bacon wished to free the mind of cultural conventions through his list of distractions, thereby labeling them, oh, one could uh, maneuver around their enticing shells, he provides them with a name stock full of religious implications. He calls these distractions idols. Go to the next image. Of course, Bacon did not mean for them to have religious connotations, intending to draw the word from the Greek eidolon, meaning image or phantom, as employed by Epicurean physics. For Bacon, there existed four distractions, four distractions that formed barriers to discerning the truth. First, there were, or there was, the idol, the idols of the tribe, idola tribus which are common to the race. Second are idols of the cave, idola specus, which are peculiar to the individual. Third are idols of the marketplace, idola forti, coming from the misuse of language. And fourth, idols of the theater, idola theatri, resulting from the abuse of authority. Let's go through some of these. So according to Bacon, idols of the tribe. These are things that, remember, these idols are what distract us. We have to get uh, so get through these idols in order for us to even begin the empirical method of understanding any given phenomenon. According to Bacon, idols of the tribe are natural, innate weaknesses common to all of humanity. Now, we have weaknesses that need to be recognized in order to be controlled, if not eliminated, when one is investigating any philosophical or scientific inquiry. Bacon believes that we are so often deceived by what we think and what we see and what we hear and what we touch that our physical bodies are not as precise as what we believe them to be. And so we are often tricked. We're fooled by our very sense organs. Bacon prescribes that we use instruments and methodologies that are able to move beyond the limitation of these physical bodies. In fact, as a natural survival skill, humans often create more order than what actually exists in order to compartmentalize the information in such a way to make it understandable, to make it digestible, creating relations with what we already know to make sense out of what we don't know. But this inclination often moves the body towards more conventional methodologies, more conservative suppositions, and ultimately back to the very traditions which Bacon is working so hard to convince people not to follow in order to come up with the better, more advanced solutions. We have this habit of creating order 
where there may be only chaos. Beyond this, Idols of the Tribe encompasses our inclinations of wishful thinking, nurturing faith that there is an order to everything we examine and that this order arises from perception that we've come to believe as true as reality as the way the world works, or at least should work. In a sense, we will believe what we want to believe, what we were taught to believe, and are often unable to come up with any original thought on any given phenomenon or process. As a result, we tend to make premature judgments before all the evidence has been gathered and carefully examined. Whew. Anyway, there we are. <laughs> There's a kid outside that just yelled, yay. All right, Bacon's next one is Idols of the Cave. Idols of the Cave um, is geared more to the individual rather than the general human population. But now this is more the individual now. Distractions that are created not through natural inclinations that are the idols of the tribe, but these are idols that are learned as a result of cultural conditioning, creating our personal prejudices and distortions and learned beliefs arriving from how we were raised, in particular, our families, uh, from our experiences while growing up especially the earlier years where we are just beginning to comprehend the world through our young and very impressionable minds. From our religious upbringing, what we were told was morally right and wrong, truth and lie, good and evil. From our education, whether we had much formal education or none or somewhere in between, right? Or, or even uh, of course, uh, the wisdom that rise through prolonged experience. Uh, how about from our social class? If we grew up poor or rich or middle class, you know, old money, new money, no money. <laughs> right? Uh, from our gender, the culture we learn, if we are men or women or somewhere in between, and so much more. Of course, this cultural idolatry that distracts one from seeking after the truth always has its share of authorities that appear to orchestrate these convictions. And Bacon criticizes these sources and our reverence for them, he believes. We are often trained and conditioned culturally not to see what may actually be there. We are trained not to see the truth that may be found actually within nature. And of course, uh, in Bacon's Idols of the Marketplace, he denotes these distractions are the result of the intercourse and associations of men with each other. He quotes, that's a quote. And the problem we have in explaining any given phenomena or process by means of human-made language. We can, we can put down the I think they'll know the theater will be next. Thank you, Margie, for that. And, and now, of course, obviously, our very vocabularies, right? Uh, discourses, jargon, slang, and that, you know, an analogies, right? It limits our ability uh, to encompass the truth. Bacon declares, quote, the idols imposed by words on the understanding are of two kinds. They're either names of things that do not exist or misleading names for things that do exist. We need new words, right, to explain these things. Of course, we're going to get new scientific words <laughs> from Greek and Latin, right? We're, you know, if you're, if you're in the sciences, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we're going to have new definitions because we need more exact ways of describing something and sometimes uh, making it nice and long for us to read because <laughs> we're trying to be so exacting. Okay, Bacon applies... Uh, Three categorizations for the idols of the theater. Uh, so basically, under the, the uh, for the um, the fourth one, idols of the theater. Uh, this has to do with authorities. He's dealing with the authorities at that time. First of all, he deals with empirical uh, philosophy. Even though he's all for empirical philosophy, uh, this authority he still says that it's not the end all for all engagements of natural phenomena and processes. In particular, Bacon did not care too much for those who claimed these all encompassing systems uh, based upon one tiny little discovery. The second category uh, under Idols of the Theater was uh, what he calls sophistical philosophy, which basically it's scholasticism, which we're back to Aristotle. Let's kick Aristotle some more, shall we? <laughs> yeah, it's Aristotelian ideas. Yeah. Well, you know what? Aristotle deserves that kick. 
Remember, Aristotle believed that when you're born in a certain placement in the universe, that's where you begin. That's where you need to stay. So if you're born as a certain class, that's where you're supposed to be. If you're born a slave, you should stay a slave. You know, Thomas Aquinas would use that. Th those ideas would, would be used to support slavery. You know that, right? Yeah. So I, I can I can bash him a few times. I like his logic, though. Ethos, pathos, logos. That's pretty cool. And, you know, categorization and zoolog. That's all really good stuff. But just stay out of metaphysics. That's all, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And, of course, uh, some of his other ideas, like, you eh, know, yeah. we just talked about this, right? Okay. So here we go. Uh, so he goes and he says that whereby arguments are created without established proof based. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's all these theoretical and philosophical suppositions. And then for the most part, uh, these ideas are abstract and pragmatic. They have nothing to do with the real world. These ideas of scholasticism were in 11 to the 1500s. The third category of the idols of theater are those are superstitious philosophy where Bacon hits hard by rejecting any theory that intentionally mixes philosophy with theology or any other type of religious thought. They need to stay separate, he believes. He says, for Bacon, you cannot start investigating how the world began from the book of Genesis and then read any scientific evidence through that lens, but instead start afresh without distractions to examine the evidence from nature itself. And if the evidence then demonstrates aspects that are re relevant to Genesis, then that's okay. Just not the other way around. In a sense, Bacon is trying to get the scholastic community to free themselves from an a relig religious agenda to demonstrate their beliefs, feeling this will only bias their materials. So according to Bacon, after freeing oneself from these idols, the mind becomes free to induct without distraction. And so uncovering the form the manner in which actual natural phenomena occur, and once arriving at this realization can move from there to actual causes. Uh, one assertion bothered Bacon more than any other, uh, and that was, of course, a smug pronouncement by many of his contemporaries that most, if not all, truth had already been discovered, and the rest of learning involved simply by filling in all the, the blanks. That's it. Oh, that bothered him tremendously. Bacon thought this idea was, was rubbish. Um, perhaps one of his most uh, uh, idealistic endeavors, he said about working on a work known as the New Atlantis of 1623. Let's go to the next picture. I believe it'll be, it'll be something of the New Atlantis. There we go. Yeah, there it is, New Atlantis. Uh, it was probably... It was, it, it, Wrote in 1623, it's finally published in 1627. Here, Bacon envisioned an ideal land, where I'm actually quoting from him, where generosity and enlightenment, dignity and splendor, piety and public spirit, unquote, were but everyday virtues for the populace of Bensalem. Within this land, he imagined the ideal university. He called it Solomon's House organized in many ways like a modern research institute today, always encouraging applied scientific research. Most intriguing are Bacon's uh, categorization of his research team that would go out and explore the world. Uh, Bacon states, quote, for the several employments and offices of our fellows, we have 12 that sail into foreign countries under the names of other nations for our own we conceal who brings the books and abstracts and patterns of experiments of all other parts. These we call merchants of light, unquote. In this realm, the best states of humanity were not behind them, but ahead. And the spirit of progressivism uh, permeates every corner of this book. So we have this idea that uh, human progress is possible. In Bacon's The Argument uh, of, of Science, 1623, duty to one's community, identified as ethical matter, and duty to God, identified as religious matter, were defined. And you can see here that uh, he strongly believed that there was good, even the ultimate good, it, it did exist out there, but, uh, but we need to nature good habits. 
They can realize that no universal rules could be created because of the uniqueness of each individual will and the uniqueness of each given situation. So we are unique. Discussing religious faith, Bacon declared that the more discordant, therefore, and incredible the divine mystery is, the more honor is shown to God in believing it, and the nobler is the victory of faith. Well, you can imagine that. It did not take long for Bacon to tackle the issue of God itself. Did he really exist? Or was he a convenient invention of the human mind to help explain the unexplainable and to also help humanity create a sense of control of the natural world uh, through some kind of divine agency, able to hear or even to accommodate various petitions and requests? Yet his final assessment in his work known as Of Atheism was not one of despair and abandonment of belief, but one of hope. Stating matter-of-factly, he says, a little philosophy inclineth man's mind to atheism, but death in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. And so he says this. In his work on superstition, Bacon states matter-of-factly, it were better to have no opinion of God at all than such an opinion as is unworthy of him. So he's still mixing in these beliefs. I Go to the next one. I think this next one will be relevant. If not, uh, oh yeah, there it is. We're, we're talking about this. Still, Bacon accepted personally uh, in his own life Christian convictions and attempted to apply them to his life, which seemed to be a problem, but he did. Uh, but if you would think that such a conclusion would serve to hamper Bacon from his pursuit of the truth and create in him an intellectual conservatism that would not admit ideas that could possibly challenge that faith system, you would severely be mistaken. For his religious views allowed for progress, for evolution, and he bucked against tradition. Even tradition buttressed by religious ecclesiastical authority. He had little time for those uh, who asserted that the best days of humanity were experience in antiquity and that scholars should vigilantly move through all their inquiries with the lamp of tradition to illuminate the way. You see, through the popularity uh, of the understood Christian Latin West beliefs of his day, the world, because of sin, did not deserve to progress, to evolve, but should be satisfied with the fact that this presumed evil and corrupt world would someday come crashing to an end, permitting this planetary carcass to be replaced with a splendid heavenly paradise based upon a godly ideals, as opposed to human pride and vanity that can only create empty gestures in comparison to divine realities. The fall of humanity from the blissful Garden of Eden was to be understood as a fall indeed, with humanity becoming increasingly worse, sinking further and further down into the mire, becoming utterly degenerate and almost, well, unredeemable. Of course, there were momentary occasions when the tides turned for civilizations, for instance, uh, during the time intended to prepare the way for the arrival of Christ and the decipherment of the message, that being, of course, the Roman Empire, ramping up, and so, so to speak, with the combined great learning of Jews and Greeks, but that was merely a momentary distraction, a slight deviation from the downable road that humanity was now intended to take, because everything was intended to all come tumbling down, much like an earthly Humpty Dumpty, with no king's horses or king's men to put all back together again. And you should not attempt to cheat fate, it was said. To do so was hubris indeed. Naturally, the belief that everyone was going downhill quickly became an intellectual, self-fulfilling prophecy. And that prophecy, the ideas of Augustine, really was much of the undergirding for the fall of the Latin West. For Bacon, all this stilted traditionalism needed to be revealed for what it was, a false security blanket to obscure the fact that the very best theologians and so-called scientists at that time knew very little about the universe and filled the ever-expansive gaps with bits and pieces of out-of-context speculations from antiquity that were hardly tested here and there, <laughs> tattered and worn, 
theological cliches for good measures so as to make church establishment, well, you know, happy. We can take down this image. No, says Bacon. No. Scholars were not to curtail their scientific pursuits and reverence to the idols of tradition, but were to strike out bravely on their own, discovering new solutions to old problems and understanding nature herself unhindered by concerns for the status quo. Much like the intrepid explorers of his day, discovering the new world, which is always problematic, of course, in certain ways, and finding all new societies, exotic cultures, and religions, Bacon wished to place the scholar on the very same voyage, moving inquiries towards a distant, uncharted shore. Bacon realized the new world of possibilities, both literally, geographically, and figuratively philosophically and scientifically, still made 17th century Europeans insecure. It made them uncertain. It made them prone to cling to conventions of the past for security, much like a baby hangs on to their mother. But Bacon believed it was time to grow up, to move from milk to solid food. Tradition did not hold the keys to survival in this new world. No, Instead, new approaches would enable humanity to adapt to new situations. In fact, Bacon became the very first major European writer to embrace the need for humanity to innovate new answers through reason to evolve and to change. In his mind, the traditions of the past were often based upon supposition upon supposition that were deliberately held together with a lot of theoretical and unproven speculations and that the more gentle wind of practical scientific knowledge could easily knock these lofty edifices down. In fact, he believed so much of what held this grandiose scheme together in the first place was so much empty talk, mere words that were further distorted by the idols of destruction. Instead of intangibles, human knowledge should result in tangibles, in very real results that can be proven through a series of tests. Yes, actual deeds rather than mere words. As for attempting to understand who we are as human beings, why shouldn't we look to the natural laboratory of nature herself? So much can be gleaned about who we are from this very real physical environment through observation of the various processes at work, which can be tested and cataloged and defined. So for Bacon, the legacy of medieval scholasticism, so much based upon the precepts of Aristotle, it must be done away with, or at least greatly modified, and a new methodology explored. Bacon declared, quote, the scholastic logic now in use serves more to fix and give stability to the heirs which have their foundation in common received nations than to help the search after the truth, unquote. Intellectual presuppositions must uh, must give way to scientific facts, yet one shouldn't go the other direction completely either. There were one decides to only use the senses to understand the world. There still needs to be some mental construction to get to the point of demonstrating certain facts. This leads to the famous passage where Bacon divides all philosophers into men of experiment and men of dogmas. He asserts, this is a great one, the men of experiment are like the ant, the only collect and use. The reasoners resemble spiders who make cobwebs out of their own substance. But the bee takes a middle course. It gathers its materials from the flowers of the garden and of the field, but transforms and digests it by the power of its own. None unlike this is the true business of philosophy. For Bacon, empirical evidence should reside at the heart of natural philosophy. And through his theory of induction, he believed humanity will be capable of realizing a new type of gnosis, knowledge able to ready us for the new challenges ahead to match the discoveries made by the European explorers. And the goal for this better understood empirical knowledge to be found, well, uh, of course, obviously freedom. We need to have the freedom of inquiry. There's no utopia that's possible without the freedom to be able to share and to contemplate the possibility of these ideas. We need freedom. 
complete freedom. Well, that's him. What do you think? Of? So that's bacon. I presume that bring home the bacon pretty well. All right. So where do we go from here? So okay. So so basically, well, throughout the 17th century, who did um, scientists who did believe the theories of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo wondered exactly how the planets and other heavenly bodies managed to orbit around the sun in orderly fashion. What kept them locked in predictable way, according to Aristotle and Ptolemy, the spheres and the cosmos in general were arranged according to their weight, with the Earth being the heaviest of all, and so the center of the universe according to the geocentric beliefs. It would be Sir Isaac Newton, 1642 to 727, that finally came up with a credible response to this inquiry. Let's go to this picture. Let's look at old Isaac here. Hey, Isaac, you're coming up there. Let's see. I may have one more bacon there. Let's see. Let's go to the next one. Hey, there's bacon. There's Isaac. Sorry. In 1687, he published uh, his philosophical uh, natural uh, uh, principles of mathematics, which would lead to the scientific paradigm shift, but also directly affect all other disciplines, inclusive of theology, astronomy, physics, and, and philosophy. First of all, next image. First of all, Newton asserted that uh, that objects in motion stay in motion unless an external force uh, is applied to it, understood as meaning that if someone throws a ball, it will continue to move unless something stops it, whether hitting another object that is stable or sheer friction. Second, the next one, next slide. Second, Newton proposed uh, that the relationship between object and mass and acceleration is equal to the force of that object. And third, uh, next one, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite uh, uh, reaction. The slide's a little mixed up there, but it's okay. Uh, thank you. Oh, actually, keep going. Newton did outlaw the physical laws. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I like this drawing. So why don't we go there? Outline the physical laws of how objects move and interact with other forces and objects resulting in the law of gravity, which became the fundamental premise for the articulation of what is called classical mechanics. We are talking about the beginning of the modern world, aren't we? One of the two subfields of mechanics and physics, the other being, of course, quantum mechanics. Of course, classical mechanics uh, is what made the mechanization of the following industrial revolution possible. Uh, certainly a paradigm shift by every possible consensus there. Let's go to the next image here. Oh, so you can see uh, the law of gravity, classical mechanics. Uh, every particle attracts every other particle uh, in the universe with force directly proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Uh, let's go to the next one. You see where well, this leads into a ripple uh, in mathematics. Oh, I do want to talk about this guy, even though it's a little off, but why not? Uh, uh, I, I just look look at this guy. Uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, uh, 1646 to 1716. I just want to mention him. He, he's, he's a genius. Uh, influence, of course, obviously very much part of classical mechanics. Uh, he, he was an expert in philosophy, theology, ethics, politics, history, music. Um, he was biology, medicine. Uh, he's the one who came up with a differential and integral calculus, you know, differential. This is rates at which uh, quantities change. And, of course, integral uh, calculus, continuous analog of sum used to uh, calculate areas of volume, you know, integration process of computing and integral. He was also the pioneer, this is the fun part, of mechanical calculators. <laughs> he was describing a pinwheel calculator as early as 1685. He invented the Leibniz wheel, uh, used in arithmetic, uh, you know, obviously used for uh, mass-produced calculators. And he had a cylinder with a set of teeth, uh, incremental lengths coupled with a counting wheel. So anyway, so uh, so Newton is, you know, and, and of course, Leibniz are starting this massive change uh, in the paradigm uh, within uh, classical uh, mechanics. And that's important for us, but we have to go somewhere else. So uh, I'm not sure if the next one applies. Let's go to the next one. If not, we'll just take it down. Next image. Oh, yeah. This is more going into details of, of how mechanics and how these all these pro things just boom, 
during this time, uh, thanks to uh, Newton Leibniz. Uh, let's go to the next one. That's great. I love that chart. Um, okay, so we'll put, we'll take one that one down. Uh, that's but we'll we'll go there later. Thank you so much, Margie. All right, so oh, I, I, hope, I apologize. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned him. I know I feel it was wrong if I didn't. <laughs> so ethically wrong, I don't know. We're going through all this. So um, Newton then outlined the physical laws of how objects move and interact with other forces and objects, as I said, resolving in gravity. But on another level, Newton's theory generated belief in a stable as well as constant laws that govern the universe. Now we know this is not true, but, but this time it's true. Establishing that the cosmos beyond the earth was just as predictable, measured, and balanced. As a result, Newton's theories were applied to metaphysics, used to demonstrate the reality of what is understood as natural law, and in a sense, a rational universe. By deduction, what was true for one part of the universe was thereby true on another. In regards to the movement of the planets and other heavenly objects, Newton discerned that they move in an orderly fashion via what he described as mutual attraction. Through gravity, Newton realized that the force of gravity towards the whole planet did arise from and was compounded of the forces of the gravity toward all its parts and towards every one part was the inverse proportion of the square of the distance from that part. While Newton was a very religious man, many uh, within religious circles did resist his theories. Uh, he, they believed actually that his, he believed that his, Assertion that the invisible force was connecting to govern the movements of all things, inclusive of the universe, as bringing about occult agencies into science. That this is magic. <laughs> uh, he didn't think that at all, but they thought so. Uh, in the second edition of the uh, Principia, uh, published in 1713, Newton addresses his opponents in a concluding uh, statement. Uh, saying basically uh, was firm about the idea of gravitational attraction. He said that this did not define the cause for this phenomenon, nor did he imply it, for God could be this cause. He's just describing what it is. Why should he be censored for that fact? Newton was uh, also fundamentally opposed to the postulations of a French philosopher by the name of René Descartes, uh, 1596 to 1650, and the ideas of rationalism in general. You know, uh, Descartes, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. Um, in the ideas, he can be certain he exists because he thinks. Uh, for, for Descartes, uh, humans are a dualism between mind and body and are distinct from one another with the mind utterly invisible, just as God uh, is distinct and invisible to humans. But he was still very much Aristotelian in his approach. Everything worked uh, towards a goal, to our final cause. And we're ripping apart Aristotle right now. So yeah, so Newton said, uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, so uh, Newton believed in a universal gravitation. And then of course, obviously, uh, these ideas will come together with, with, with Bacon. But the Newtonian intellectual revival, with its metaphysical view of a natural law governing all truth, began to dominate much of the scientific and philosophical underpinning of all critical inquiries in Western Europe, with a perspective affecting the intellectual paradigm for the next two centuries. This worldview next combined with the epistemology of John Locke. Now we can see old John <laughs> there uh, advocating that we learn about the nature of reality exclusively through our senses. So Margie, let's uh, let's see old John, Mr. Locke himself. Thank you. There we are. According to his essay, thank you so much, Margie, thank you, essay concerning human understanding, Locke proposed that we learn about the nature of reality exclusively through our senses. Locke argued against anything that influenced each individual before their own birth, thereby disagreeing with Augustine that humanity was born with original sin, along with Descartes' views that each individual was born with certain innate 
logical proposition. In fact, Locke turned against all medieval philosophy in general, asserting that we were not born with any innate ideas at all. Instead, Locke believed each one of us was, in fact, a blank slate, a tabula rasa in Latin, shaped and molded by our experiences. In fact, all our ideas either derive from our sensations or our reflections. In this re reception of knowledge upon our tablet, we either, uh, we either understand it in a simple manner uh, through passive receptions from daily experience or in a complex way as products of sustained mental exercise. Yes, I'm quoting him. Therefore, what we know as not the external world in itself but the results of the interaction of their minds with the outside world. So there we have that. Um, because humanity is not born with innate ideas, we are changeable, not tied to any form of inborn determinism, only susceptible to our surrounding physical and social environment. Theoretically, then, if one modify the individual's physical and social environment, they could change them too, right? You could change. Now, um, go to the next one. Um, John Locke. Oh boy, that one's really small. Well, maybe we'll just take that one down. It's too small comparing Hobbes and now John wrote his two uh, treatises of government during the reign of Charles II. That's another very important idea. Here he declared, rulers are not absolute in their power, but were instead bound to the law of nature. You seen how it, it's it's like a all these steps or puzzle pieces are coming together. Are you seeing it? Yeah, you're one by one coming together. Uh, and that nature was orchestrated based upon the dictates of reason, being a rational universe as proposed by Newton. According to this natural law, all humans, including the king, were thereby equal and independent, all being made in the image of God. And of course, that's good, yeah, Gospel of John, but it's also good Platonism, right? The image idea. Because of this, everyone, see, if, if we are all the image of God, we're all born with a blank slate, guess what happens here? Not only is there this, this vertical connection, but there's this horizontal connection that we are then born equal. You see that? We're all absolutely born equal. And therefore, because that's our nature, we're by nature born equal. It sounds like inalienable rights, anybody, right? Uh, so power then did not come from the king, but instead from the people uh, who they govern. The people entered into political contracts, empowering legislatures and monarchs to judge of disputes in order to preserve their natural rights, which include the possession of property, but not to give rulers an absolute power over them. Uh, of course, I'm quoting, obviously, him. Now, if a monarch or a legislature violates this contract, both could be legitimately overthrown, according to Locke. Locke's arguments were used specifically against absolutism and in favor of limit, limited government. Or have you seen how scientific ideas uh, are, you know, mixing with religious ideas, mixing with uh, metaphysics, the science is, is influencing what? Yeah, politics. <laughs> it all kind of flows together, one to the other, because guess where we're going? As you can imagine, this assertion found its way in the American Declaration of Independence in 1776. And of course, obviously concerning arguments of liberty and the social contract later influenced people like Alexander Hamilton, right? James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, the founding fathers. In fact, several passages of the second treatise are reproduced verbatim in the Declaration of Independence, most notably the reference to a long train of abuses. Such was Locke's influence that Thomas Jefferson wrote as follows, quote, Bacon, this is called quoting Jefferson, Bacon, Locke, and Newton. I consider them as the three greatest men that have ever lived without any exception, and as having laid the foundation of those superstructures which have been raised in the physical and moral sciences. 
unquote. Whoa, <laughs> I just went there, didn't I? Hey, we just went over those three. I know. Uh, views at that time, Locke entered into discussions of religion in his letters concerning toleration. Locke believed that each person was empowered to protect, protect the civil order and property, but that such abilities were thwarted when the government decided to legislate on matters concerning religion and crossed the line, uh, especially when they mandated the conformity to a single church. Toleration of other religious beliefs was part of government policy. There has to be a separation between church and state. Locke defined three arguments as central to his discussion of tolerance. Number one, earthly judges, the state of a particular and human beings generally cannot dependently evaluate the truth claim of competing religious standpoints. Number two, even if they could, Enforcing a single true religion would not have the desired effect because belief cannot be compelled by violence. And number three, uh, coercing religious uniformity would lead to more social disorder than allowing diversity. No, separation. These ideas also will be found within our founding fathers as well. With Locke, he drew the line of in, in, in England against uh Obviously, he had certain problems with Catholicism, although he will change his views later on. But here we are. We're right in the middle of the Enlightenment. Welcome to the Enlightenment. We are being Enlightenment uh, in many ways. So with Locke's philosophy defining the Enlightenment, we now have a rational universe. People by those who are able to understand it exclusively through the rational faculties of their own minds. In fact, the entire basis of the Enlightenment was that there was a reasonable universe out there, one with absolutes, and one where it was believed that with enough time, effort, patience, the serious inquirer uh, could possibly comprehend. This supposition also became the basis for a new philosophical religious enlightenment belief system known as deism, which we'll talk about. The enlightenment is generally to, uh, thought to run from the 1620s to the 1780s, Immanuel Kant referred to the Enlightenment as man's release from his self-incured tutelage, tutelage being man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. And so the ideas of Bacon, Newton, and Locke are cemented into the worldview. And of course, we have four prominent philosophers of the Enlightenment that come about, Baruch uh, Spinoza, Voltaire, David Hume, and Immanuel Kant. Let's go and see these images here. I think we have something here. Um, uh, the next picture. Here you go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so Baruch Spinoza. Uh, I like this guy. Um, he viewed all things as part or aspects of God, including nature herself. So these are prominent Enlightenment philosophers. Let's go to the next image. I actually have an image I found. I worked hard to find this image. Look at that. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. He viewed all things as part or aspects of God, including nature herself. And because of this fact, some scholars view him as advocating a form of pantheism, right? Um, and, of course, according to Spinoza, God is the causa sui, containing all reason uh, for existence within itself and was at the same time both creator, natura natrans, and creation, natura naturata. God was also viewed by Spinoza as an all-embracing substance with this substance infinite and proceeding beyond the comprehension of humanity with the exception of two attributes, which you see on here, that of thought, cogitario, manifest in ideas, and extension, manifest in physical bodies, both modes of which were perfectly parallel. All individual human intellect for Spinoza was a reality, mere emanations from the divine intellect operating out of necessity, and hence, Individual thought was an actuality, an aspect of impersonal intellect. So you can see it all here. Because of this individual personality was only temporary, because it was temporary, free will was an illusion. And the personal 
Immortality was simply a blending into God after death, folding back into the collective that was essentially the one, but still in essence, nature herself, right? The individual drawing or attraction to the one was viewed as love. Spinoza believed the highest of human virtues was to contemplate God uh, in love, amor dea intellectualis. Yet distraction from the pure divine love must be defeated in order to attain the state of loving intellectual contemplation. And this includes the taming of the passions and to seek reason as the measuring rod for all life's riddles and hurdles. That's a, a, that's a, that's a great chart. I'm so happy I had that one. Okay, you can put it down now. That's great. I love it. So who is the Spinoza? <clears throat> all right, Spinoza, he grew up in Amsterdam. Uh, so he's, he's a Dutch philosopher. Uh, his ancestors were Sephardic Jews uh, thrown out of Spain by the decree in, uh, in, in 1492. Nevertheless, Spinoza's family were forced to convert to Christianity in 1498. Um, what happened now is that uh, uh, Spinoza's father uh, moved to the Dutch city of Amsterdam, and they reasserted their Jewish faith. What happened from there is that he then grew up in a traditional Jewish manner. He learned the Torah. Uh, he studied the Talmud. Uh, Baruch uh, revealed a penchant for asking way too many questions, right? And not receiving adequate response. But he also revealed a tendency to come up with possible answers of his own. Uh, and uh, were not quite, how do I say this, conventional to his peers. Uh, Spinoza, um, uh, his brother took over his dad's business, so he became a full-time philosopher. He was known for his uh, extreme zeal, too much zeal. Finally, uh, the Jewish community said enough uh, and issued a writ of cherim, which is basically excommunication. I actually have the excommunication here. Uh, Spinoza was cursed with all the curses mentioned in Deuteronomy and cursed with the curse of Elisha, a curse considered so severe that when Elisha used it, the children who were cursed were shredded into pieces by ferocious bears. And so he was exiled and he found himself kind of moving about different groups. Uh, Spinoza uh, joined traditional, uh, sorry, joined uh, these, these non-traditional Christians uh, wanting to go back to the first Christianity. He joined them for a while. He studied all these different philosophies. He did indeed, of course, study uh, Platonism. Obviously, you can see this uh, when I just described was very much Platonism. He did study the Kabbalah, absolutely. So he integrated the Kabbalah uh, with Platonism. Uh, he also brought in uh, the um, the Islamic mystic Al Farabi uh, into his perspectives too. So yeah, he just kind of brought it all together. At first, Spinoza followed Descartes' dualistic premise that the mind, intellect, and the body were two unique, separate substances, but eventually. He changed his views to assert that intellect and body were one single substance and identity. Uh, he also talked about evil. This is interesting, evil. Spinoza arrived at the conclusion that what we think of as good and evil are related to human pleasure and pain. Spinoza articulated his belief that, uh, that good and evil were, in fact, relative concepts depending upon the individual experiencing these ideas, and were thereby subjected to interpretation. Even general conceptions of what were good or evil, as forwarded by many societies, as evident through seemingly cultural consensus, were in reality good and evil specifically for that particular cultural construct or for humans in general. But for Spinoza, there were other life forms to consider beyond that of humanity. For nature was diverse with life, and he was given to call all the plurality of these beings. He called them entities. He even considered the animal kingdom and the natural world within his perspectives. Very unusual, by the way, for his time. Hence, for Spinoza, everything is determined within nature. Within nature, uh, he declared all things in nature proceed from certain definite necessity and with utmost perfection. Thus, there's not a chance for events to happen by chance. Uh, because all human behavior is fully determined in Spinoza's mind, our freedom arises from our ability to understand 
why we act the way we are determined to act. Uh, so in one of his letters, I have it right here. Uh, I'm just going to uh, just summarize uh, that letter. He basically says, we are not to fight uh, this determinism, trying to stop the process through our will, because that is impossible. No, he says in this letter uh, to G.H. Uh, uh, Schaller, uh, no, but we are to be resolved to know just why this is where we are supposed to be proceeding and ask questions based upon this realization. Through realization of our determined makeup, we come to know ourselves even emotionally to the point of illumination. And as a result, become fully realized a cause of both the internal and external effects that we cause, that we were fashioned to cause, making us a more efficient cause in respect to our effects and thereby increasing our productivity. The goal then, is to realize our cause and our natural effects and to become more and more active in what nature has determined us to be rather than be a passive part of it. Be involved. Do you know that you're caught in this destiny? Become fully in, in, involved in that process. Fully realize and do that job or that function as efficiently as possible. Uh, so anyway, he also talked about the Bible and Spinoza's estimation. Uh, he says that uh, it's unable to talk about the entire nature of God. He asserted the Bible was not really relevant to philosophical discussions or civil law. And so it needs to be left what is fashioned to be. It's supposed to be a moral guide for certain behaviors in respect to God. That's its usage. But keep it out of the other area. Uh, but uh, he got himself in big trouble. And so he had to do an extra job as a lens grinder uh, to pay the bills. And they try to formulate unified philosophy, philosophical system. He worked very hard on it. Uh, unfortunately, his work was not published in his lifetime. And then in 1677, Spinoza died. Some saying complications of a lung condition. Other people say he was poisoned. But there you have it, uh, all the possibility. So we move on to the next one. And we'll talk, we'll talk briefly on this one. In fact, we'll go through this real quick. So next picture. Yeah, let's see. Here we go. There. Next one here. Yeah, Vol okay. So okay, so we're at Voltaire. Uh Voltaire um, was a very prolific writer, produced works uh in all different kinds of literary forms, plays, poetry, novels, essays, scientific works, historical works, more than 20,000 letters and 2,000 books attributed to him. He was educated by Jesuits, as you as you can believe. Um he definitely offended French authorities by his writings. Uh, he even was thrown into the Bastille at one point. Um, he went to England, found England far more tolerant, and then wrote about how tolerant they are, which, of course, offended the French even further. He spent most of his life uh, in the area of, uh, of Geneva, on the border there with France. He wrote the Candidi uh, in 1759, which he attacked, of course, the ideas of religious persecution and war. In this, in this novel, Kennedy, uh, he lived a sheltered life in this paradise and is doctrinated by this optimism by his mentor, uh, Panglos. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, he's thrown out of this lifestyle and falls into disillusionment and great hardships of the world. And, and of course, in the process, you discover all these irredeemable evils about. Let's go to the next image. So basically right here, uh, this shift from theological or metaphysical concerns to the human condition is one of the Voltaire's main uh, contributions to the Enlightenment. As a result of Voltaire's assault of uh, philosophical optimism, it became legitimate for intellectuals to refuse formal thought by appeal to human experience. Theology was displaced from the center of intellectual activity a movement that encouraged both investigation into the cause of human misery and a reform of conditions that perpetuated suffering and injustice. Uh, one thing he wrote about, it was a great earthquake of Lisbon in 1755. It happened on November 1st, by the way, which is a holy day. Everybody was in church that day. I mean, everybody was in church. And the earthquake was about a 7.7 .7 magnitude. Uh, it basically killed everybody while attending church on that day. Uh, the whole city was devastated. We're talking around 12,000 people died uh, in this horrendous tragedy. And yet the only section that survived of the city that wasn't flattened 
was the red light district. <laughs> so people start going, wait, God was good. How come that survived and everything else was destroyed? And so this terrible tragedy uh, rocked the world and, of course, fueled Voltaire and his thoughts about the human condition and mistrust. By the way, uh, this is another talk, but uh, a guy by the name of Horace Walpole, inspired by this tragedy, started writing. He wrote what's called The Castle of Otranto in 1765 which is the beginning of the horror genre, the first horror a novel that leads later on to the horror genre of the 19th century, and of course, horror movies in the 20th century. Yeah, so Voltaire is all about alliteration and so forth. So we move on to the next guy. Let's go to the next image. There's David Hume. Uh, there we have it. So let's, let's go to the next slide, David Hume. Uh, he talked about is art problem. Obviously, the is ought problem is, uh, in meta ethics is articulation here. That, uh, uh, however, basically the idea is that um, there seems to be a significant difference between descriptive statements about what is and prescriptive or normative statements about what ought to be. And it is not obvious how one can get from making descriptive statements to prescriptive. This is ought problem is also known as a Hume law uh, or the Hume guillotine uh, of thought. And so basically, David Hume came to the belief that true religion is founded upon reason and reason alone, which enables the rational investigator to perceive an intellectual designer behind the orchestrations of nature. Yet this designer cannot be fully known. It was not readily distinguishable as an entity. Uh, so he's perceived as an atheist. Uh, let's go to the next image. Um, so skepticism, obviously. Uh, so induction is not always right. Uh, so basically, Bacon's scientific method does not always lead to truth. From what is, we cannot infer what will be. No absolute truth. Any belief is as justified as any other. Science is nothing but a set of beliefs shared by the scientific community. So we got Hume there. Thus, in order to appease these uncertain forces, uh, various unusual rituals and observances are introduced into the suppliant's life. In this context, the individual finds comfort in priests and other religious figures believed to possess the power to protect them. So, uh, so basically, so we're going here. The sermon arises from the ability of the person endowed with reason to construct clear arguments concerning the nature of the universe. With these speculations, the enlightened can deduce the presence of a divine central cause. However, the natural theism of philosophers is not easily accessible to a vulgar crowd. Let's go to the next image. Okay, so we're on to the next one. So, um, Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant uh, asserted that the sole source of morality and the world, as it really is, is unknowable. Now, Kant uh, he grew up in Konigsberg, old capital of, of Prussia, uh, and um, Kant loved routine. The locals used to joke that his neighbors virtually set their watches to his daily habits and walks. But he was a pietist. He was very ritualistic. At 16, he enrolled in the University of Konigsberg. He moved into philosophy. Uh, and so what happened is that uh, he started going into transcendental idealistic philosophy, which held to the precept that both time and space were not physically real, in fact, but were actually the direct manifestation of our own internal sense of intuition. Even more importantly, uh, Kant revolutionized philosophical conceptions about the nature of time itself determine that time is not a thing in itself determined from experience, objects, motion, and change, but rather uh, a framework of human mind that preconditions possible experience. And so, you know, Kant uh, theorized that there was more to the brain that meets the eye. Kant believed that some there, there was the, some type of ordering principle that did reside in the mind. There are these, you know, these ideas there, but um, uh, what happens is, is that... Uh, uh, he doesn't come up with an, an answer to it. Uh, so what happens is that he goes, uh, at the age of 46, he enters into a silent era for 11 years until he comes up with an answer. Uh, people are writing to him saying, hey, you know, uh, could you do something? He's a no. Finally, he came to an answer, an epiphany. 
So Kant claimed that while natural theology was at best illusionary, the reality of ideas could be proven through the voice of conscience in humanity, which provides evidence of truths inaccessible through knowledge. He declared, I had to remove knowledge to make room for faith. Let's go to the next image. And so, of course, uh, that's, a, that's a great, so it goes into the sciences. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Okay, so we talked about Kant. Uh, and, um, and what will happen uh, is a new belief system arises. And that, of course, is known uh, as deism. So what is deism? Okay, so deism is as follows. So you can see this chart here. Deism is the belief in the existence of a supreme being, specifically of a creator who does not intervene in the universe. Uh, it believes that God does not intervene in human affairs. It does not accept miracles or supernatural revelations. This is to be distinct from theism. Theism is the belief in the existence of a God or God, specifically of a creator who intervenes in the universe. And all theism believes that God intervenes in human affairs and accepts miracles or supernatural ideas. So there is much of what we talked about. Kant will talk about these ideas that will be essential uh, to a deism uh, later on. Um, the philosophies, of course. So therefore, the God who created nature must be rational since the universe is rational. And the religion through which God was to be worshipped should be rational. Moreover, Lockean philosophy, which limited human knowledge to empirical experience, cast doubt on whether divine revelation was possible. These considerations uh, also buttress the idea of theism. Uh, John Toland uh, indicates the general tenor of this, this perspective. Toland and other writers wish to consider religion as a natural one or a rational one rather than a supernatural or mystical phenomena. Deism holds that God, as I said, does not intervene uh, in nature. He just kind of winds things up and sits back. This sounds pretty Aristotelian to me. Voltaire liked this idea. And he declared the great name of, of deist, which is not sufficiently revert, revered, is the only name one ought to take, the only gospel one ought to read, is the great book of nature written by the hand of God and sealed with a seal. The only religion that ought to be professed is a religion of worshiping God and being a good man. Now, what you don't know uh, is that, uh, you can take this image down, uh, is that uh, many of our founding fathers uh, were involved or were deists. Uh, and of course, obviously the declaration uh, of independence uh, and the Constitution was based upon the ideas of enlightenment and also aspects of deism. Uh, now, now, of course, when people say that the United States uh, is a Christian nation, they mistakenly believe that because many of those who first arrived and colonized here, but surely not all, uh, were Christians. This, uh, this is the predominant belief uh, that many people hold on to, but this is not the case. The founding fathers were profoundly vested in the beliefs of the separation of church and state. Their first assumption is that humanity is a rational being based upon the views of John Locke. Uh, no supposed metaphysical or ecclesiastical authority can determine or demand blind obedience. For humanity must be free to exercise his reason, uh, which is his fundamental right by nature. You can see this is all the enlightenment. The world here and now and not the hereafter was a primary uh, importance. You know, uh, John Adams, for example, who was very much a product of the Enlightenment, states as follows, while the second president of the United States in the Treaty of Tripoli, signed on June 7, 1797, uh, he says the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, unquote. This is Article 11. John Adams states elsewhere, where do we find a precept in the Bible for creeds, confessions, doctrines, and oaths, and whole car, car loads of trumpetry that we find religion in cover with these days of? The doctrine of the divinity of Jesus is made a convenient cover for absurdity. 
13 governments of the original states thus founded on the natural authority of the people alone with a pretense of a miracle or mystery and which are destined to spread over the northern part of the whole quarter of the globe are a great point gained in favor of the rights of mankind, unquote, from John Adams. Uh, in a letter to Charles Cushing from October 19, 1756, Adams writes, 20 times in the course of my late reading have I been up to the point of breaking out this would be the best of all possible worlds if there were no religion at all. Uh, by the way, in a letter, unquote, in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, Adams states, I almost shudder at the thought of alluding to the most fatal example of the abuses of grief, which the history of mankind has preserved. Uh, the cross, consider what calamities the engine of grief has produced, unquote. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, interpreted the First Amendment in the letter uh, to the Dansbury Baptist Association, January 1st, 1602, believing with you that religion is the matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legislative uh, powers of the government reach axioms, actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that acts, act of the American people, which declare that their legislators should make no laws respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building the wall of separation between church and state, unquote. In his bi uh, biography, Jefferson writes, an amendment was proposed by inserting the words, Jesus Christ, the holy author of a religion, which was rejected by a great majority in proof that they meant to comprehend within the mantle of its protection, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mohammedan, the Hindu and the infidel of every domination, unquote. Uh, Jefferson, uh, the statute of Virginia of religious freedom, our civil rights have no dependence on our religious opinions more than on our opinions in physics and geometry. Jefferson's notes on Virginia, the legitimate powers of the government extend to such acts only as injurious to others, but it does not mean to injure or my neighbor to say that there are 20 gods or no God and neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Also, you can see Jefferson's full of it, you know, lots of stuff. Uh, Jefferson writes um, uh, letters, uh, <laughs> Letter to John Adams on April 11, 1823, the day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus but the supreme being as his father and the womb of a virgin will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. And of course, there's more, there's tons of quotes. James Madison, Madison does the same thing. Uh, religious bondage shackles and uh, debilitates the minds and the fits it for noble enterprise during almost 15 years has legal established Christianity being on trial. Uh, what have been its fruits, more or less, in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy, ignorance and servility, laity, and both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. James, this is a whole bunch of Benjamin. I got Benjamin Franklin here. Uh, I got lots of paint. Uh, Thomas Paine, a lot of stuff. But our top many fathers, pretty much, <laughs> I, can, I actually have more pages and pages of it, but we don't have enough time. One more apparatus of the Enlightenment, and then we're going to kind of start wrapping up. And that is the Enlightenment uh, brought about, of course, the encyclopedia as overseen, organized by Denise Diderot. Uh, and the first volume appeared in 1751. It was completed in 1772. In total, this encyclopedia numbered 17 volumes of text. It is estimated that between 14,000 and 16,000 copies of various editions of the encyclopedia were sold before 1789. The encyclopedia provided the most cutting edge beliefs related to government philosophy and religion, with articles on manufacturing, canal building, ship construction, improved agriculture. Um, you know, and also it's interesting because uh, the, the encyclopedia promoted the secularization of knowledge. And so religious ideas and assumptions were removed from discussion in relation to politics, society, and ethics, have an emphasis on humanity and the idea of humanity's progress. And of course, divine law and natural law and the Middle Ages were forgotten. They kind of talk about the Greeks and Romans, and they skip the Middle Ages, which become a Middle Ages, and become something else. So where do we go from here? So this is the construct. It's a, it's a combination between Lockean epistemology and Newtonian uh, metaphysics. And we lead to the last part. Go to the chart now. It leads to positivism. Positivism. Yeah, next one here. There it is. August Comte. So, asserted that much like in nature, society itself 
function through its own set of laws. Uh, Thomas Comte talked about, known as the three stages. He states basically uh, that uh, society evolves naturally. Now, the law of the, the three stages goes as follows. First, uh, society went through what he liked to call a, a theological or supernatural uh, stage, where humanity believes that all things in the universe were, without question, directed by God or the supernatural realm in some form or other. Uh, for society, the only comprehension of reality was through the lens of God, especially in reference to the church during the Middle Ages. So you see that there. Um, you know. Now, we move on with the advent of the Enlightenment. We move into the metaphysical or abstract stage, uh, gave way, basically, uh, governed by logical rationalism, emphasizing humanity's equality in perspective to nature which was fixed by discernible laws, according to Newton, and where humanity, with their clean slate, was able to achieve great advances, according to John Locke. Now, Kant believed humanity, since the French Revolution, was ad advancing from the metaphysical to the scientific or positive stage, with the recognition that humanity can govern themselves and all may be explained and quantified scientifically. Meanwhile, Comte's convictions that humanity was progressing, evolving from a religious worldview to a secular one, became very much part of the views of those within the 19th century, uh, according to e even, even Karl Marx goes into this, right? While the Enlightenment principles originated in England, positivism was very much, this is what positivism is, very much part of the French and German philosophical systems, although it must be said that there was an overlap of methodology with the principal difference in that positivism adv advocated a complete replacement of metaphysical considerations with science ones. Of course, we have others, so obviously, uh, obviously French philosophers, uh, uh, Claude Henry and Pierre Simon Lepas, and, uh, and of course, obviously, uh, Wilma Dilthey and you know, Emily Durkheim and all those other, Leopold von Rapp. Positivism spread quickly to the United States Instead of England, most Americans in the 19th century sought their advanced degrees in Germany in places like Berlin and Heidelberg. Here, the methodology, the primary modus of epistemology was positivism that was inclusive of the scientific, philosophical, sociological, and historical disciplines. Americans returned with this heritage and brought it to bear upon academia extensively. Scholars looked for more than simply a straightforward account for they wanted extensive documentation for how you knew what you knew was genuine, was authentic. The footnote, yes, the footnote became the positivist's highest expression, equal to validation arriving from a scientist's laboratory. You knew it was sound academic article or book by up and down, eyeing up and down the page and finding footnotes everywhere in evidence. And if you really wanted to be impressive, beyond just citing sources, footnotes can be potentially become many universes of extra information for more supportive claims and for more questions that could be pursued if given more time. And so we have the beginning of the content note, you know, uh, so. So now, of course, obviously, this idea of, of, of August Kopf, uh, this idea of this the scientific age, it does influence a guy by the name of Charles Darwin and the origin of the species. And of course, basically what happens here uh, is that he, of course, overthrows the idea of Aristotle's designation of species, and it takes in more of a, a fluid idea of categorization. And of course, obviously, in a beagle, he made some observations and eventually you have this idea of we evolve as a species. We evolve as a species. See how this, these ideas are kind of connected in short. Natural selection is the process over time whereby various biological traits either increase or decrease in the given population as influenced by the environment. Uh, and so then of course, obviously then from there, uh, it goes to Herbert Spencer who built upon the Darwinian premise that things evolve within nature to the context of human society itself, and so asserted the idea of survival of the fittest. So we move from the area of knowledge uh, to, the, to the physical world, and now we're moving to society itself, 
right? Observing humanity within a social context, Spencer saw a natural tendency towards creating hierarchies and other power structures that become more complex over the centuries. Spencer ended up writing volume after a volume of works based upon Darwinian thought, since it confirmed his own thoughts, the idea that the individual competes to be excellent. Spencer made the most articulate case for the Darwinian cause, both in nature and within society. Uh, and then all this idea then jumps over to William Graham Sumner, 1840 to 1910, uh, focuses work on sociology. Uh, Sumner, of course, also focused upon, uh, uh, in general, economics as well. And as a result of that, uh, we, we get a little worse. Uh, and Sumner was against any collective effort, including public education. Uh, he believes that uh, we cannot do anything to upset natural uh, uh, excellence within various individuals. We can't, we can't stop that, let the best survive and so forth. And of course that gets worse because then these ideas will, of, of, of evolution will move into um, ideas related to uh, the evolution of like Ernest Heckel talks about the father embryology. He believes he goes into race theory that these race, one races over the other, and then this goes into this competition between nations, which goes into nationalism, the idea that, oh, no, <laughs> I know we're going there. You know, it's like, you know, certain nations evolve towards excellence. So uh, England say, we're the best. And then, of course, France will say, people of France. And Germany say, no, we're the best. Once they unify, and you can see where we're going with that one. And, of course, the United States, yes, manifest destiny, and it's a huge mess. So definitely mean <laughs> these ideas uh, are going to always work out. but. Good news, or maybe not good news, is that we're searching for this objective universe. But with the influence of romanticism and other ideas, the individual is buttressed. And we have people like botanist Lester Frank Ward uh, and this idea of dynamic sociology. And the reality is then, is that the environment always changes, always shifts, always becomes something different. In fact, the reality is, is that we live uh, in a pluralistic universe. And this, of course, leads to William James, right? This idea of pragmatism. And this is where we're, we're going to close up here. Uh, William James, he's an empirical thinker. And what happened is, is that uh, what he believes uh, is, that, uh, is that we live uh, in a pluralistic universe. Miracles become respectable. All could be correct. Anything could be true, and all is true. Uh, these radical views anticipate what physicists had come to say in the early 20th century, that there are no absolutes, that things don't always add up. Uh, and so we go into this relativism that we can't always know, that what we have to do is operate with what we have. So the old maxim of Newtonian metaphysics that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, the idea that what is we know obviously that was one true and one part of the universe is true and another uh, get that Newtonian idea co collapses. And for William James is that uh, what is true, one part of the universe is not necessarily true in another part of the universe. And it is indeed a multiverse of different possibilities, of different perspectives. And so we have to logically come up with pragmatism and pragmatism is work with what we know, work with who we understand, and then operate within that conviction. But when we ascertain or come upon information that goes against that paradigm, we should be pragmatic enough to change that paradigm to something else, to change it to the new formula. Don't let scientific, even the scientific community dictate what we do, you know, certain in-groups. We have to, we have to be open for open inquiry. And so that's one of the major ideas of William James, right? So, and of course, at this time, we're also getting uh, quantum mechanics and the whole, everything is changing. And so the whole idea of, of, of course, Lockean epistemology was torn down by people like Spencer, right, and others. And when it comes to uh, Newtonian metaphysics, uh, it starts falling apart. Uh, when it comes to William James and of course John Dewey, right? You know, you know we have to. Education needs to be practical too, uh, pragmatic. But uh, the idea becomes truth is truth by consensus. 
truth is truth by consensus. And that becomes the, the idea. We move into an objective universe, into a subjective universe. But at the same time, uh, it's very important that we still operate from what we know, from what we understand, and still try our best to work within those systems, to try to be objective, even though we have to realize that the very nature of humanity is in essence a subjective one and when it comes to religion it's open right there's a multitude of possibilities but with that multitude of possibilities hopefully we have gained in the process a sense of toleration towards others that's the ideal so we kind of leads us all the way back all the way back to Thomas Kuhn, uh, 1620, sorry, 1922 to 1996. And basically that idea is we have to be open for paradigm shifts. Scientific truth cannot be established solely by objective criteria, but is defined by consensus of the scientific community. And so truth, again, is truth by consensus. And I sense right now that we are in the middle of a scientific paradigm shift and so many people and their reputations are at stake. And once again, religion enters into that conversation. But I'm hoping that by mapping out the evolution of these ideas and how we saw the paradigm shift move from a, uh, that was understood as a geocentric universe uh, into a heliocentric universe, and also moving from the ideas of scholasticism uh, into empiricism, I'm hoping that we will be more open to further shifts that lay ahead. Well, I covered a lot, <laughs> and I think I'll conclude for right now when it comes to the evolution of so much knowledge from the Renaissance, and I think I got up to the uh, early 20th century, thank you so much for being here and have a great night.